Good evening doctors this is Dr. Hera Sanman let's continue from pulmonology section so today we are going to start with this non tuberculous mycobacterial infection like NTM infection so first of all we are going to cover this mycobacterium avium intracellular that is MIA MAI complex in the absence of HIV MAI present as cough sputum in an older person with COPD so most of uh, the time it involves you know this infection is purely associated with old age and you are going to find COPD patient especially in case of COPD patient you are going to see this infection so it's most commonly associated with older age plus COPD a single positive sputum culture is considered colonization so when you're going to get single positive sputum culture definitely it is considered to be colonization treat only if the colony grows repeatedly and respiratory symptoms are present if you're going to see any respiratory symptoms in x-ray is abnormal and colony grows repeatedly then only you need to treat that patient you need to treat that patient with the this use azithromycin or clarithromycin and rifampin or rifabutin and ethambutol. So you're going to treat your patient with either azithromycin or clarithromycin with rifampin or either you're going to use rifampin or you're going to use rifabutin and ethambutol. So three medications, azithro, rifampin and ethambutol. Alternatives you have clarithromycin in comparison to azithromycin and rifabutin in comparison to rifampin. Now we're covering rapidly growing mycobacteria. So rapidly growing mycobacteria, this mycobacterium abscesses, that is colon, uh, this colonae and mycobacterium fortuitum, right? So fortu fortuitum, sorry fortuitum mycobacterium fortuitum and this mycobacterium abscesses these are considered to be rapidly growing mycobacteria and especially the features are in fixed skin and soft tissue especially following surgery or trauma so whenever the patient is suffering from any trauma or there is any history of surgery especially in those patients if you're seeing infection in the skin and soft tissues consider these mycobacteria they grow in five to ten days lives in water and soil and look for a question describing a colonized water line in a dental unit so colonized water line in a dental unit if, if there is something clue in the question always think of this mycobacterium abscesses or mycobacterium fortitum then we have this mycobacterium canas C, right so in cancer C mycobacterium this lung disease similar to TB so these are all the types of mycobacteria although they are very rare but we need to remember we need to know some important features of these bacteria say for example lung disease which is very similar to TB and 90% with cavitary lung disease your cavitary lesions you are going to see in this mycobacterium cancer C and same medications as for mycobacterium same medication which you are giving for this MAI this intracellular that same medication you are going to give like the same is it Thromycin, clarithromycin or rifampin or rifabutin and plus ethambutol. Now we're coming towards a very important topic that is solitary pulmonary nodule. The key issue for this question is when do you answer a biopsy? That's a very important thing to remember. Now qualities of benign and malignant pulmonary nodule. So if we have a benign nodule and if we have a malignant nodule, how we are going to differentiate between them? So first of all, if a patient is like 30 years old or less than 30 years old, you can say most likely they are having benign nodule and those who are having ages of more than 40, they usually have malignant no change in size in the case of benign there is no change in size but in malignant you are going to see that it is continuously enlarging always it is associated with the smoker malignancy is associated with the smoking while benign they usually tend to present a non-smoker they having smooth borders as, as but malignant they have speculated in spikes like border most of the time benign lesions they are very small and like less than one centimeter in size but malignant they are large and more than two centimeter in size you are going to see normal lungs in the case of benign but always lungs you are finding this atelactasis in a case of malignant nodule there is no adenopathy in benign but there is adenopathy in malignant there is dense central calcification in case of benign but there is sparse eccentric calcification in the case of malignant uh, nodule normal pet scanning you are going to see in the case of this benign but abnormal pet scanning you are going to see in the case of malignant nodule so see this is there is a nodule here right up here this chest x-ray showing solitary lung nodule 
All right. So tip for us is the best initial step in all lung lesion is to compare the size with the old X-rays. Right? You must have had you know old X-rays of your patient. So always consider the size. Always you need to compare the size of these nodules. So always the best initial step is in all lung lesion you need to do X-ray because you are going to con compare X-ray in future. So you have to have old X-rays in your hand. Biopsy on in all enlarging lung lesions, particularly if they are rapidly enlarging. If you're finding that patient is having lung lesion that are rapidly enlarging, so of course you're going to do biopsy in that case. So only in that case when you're considering that the lesion is enlarging. Now management of high probability lesion. So management of high probability lesion, management of intermediate probability lesion, and management of uh, this uh, only these two. Management of intermediate intermediate probability lesions and management of high probability lesions so in the case of high probability when many of the features described under malignant in the previous table are present the answer is to resect like remove the lesion so when many of the feature described under malignant so you just need to remove the lesion when many features of malignancy are present sputum cytology needle biopsy and pet scanning should not be done because a negative test is likely a false negative if resection is one of the choices then that is the answer because it's a malignant one you need to remove it you need to resect it so just simple word simple thing to remember is this that if it's, it's a case of high probability lesion if it's a case of malignancy you need to remove that lesion in the case of management of intermediate probability lesions you may notice that there are some gray or inconclusive aspects of the solitary pulmonary nodule in the previous table such as the gap in age ranges for example over 30 or under 40 sizes like over one centimeter or under two centimeters so some findings which is in between the malignant and benign one this is the definition of intermediate so in the middle of the benign and the malignant lesion if you're finding these findings like age like in between 30 and 40 size in between 1 and 2 so you can say this is intermediate probability lesion and how what are you are going to do in that case first of all you are going to do sputum cytology if the question says cytology is positive this is highly specific and the most appropriate next step in the management is resection of course if cytology is present so your diagnosis will be malignant one and in order to rule out in order to treat that in order to manage that you have to resect that thing right so resection of the lesion a negative cytology does not exclude malignancy so if it's positive definitely it's a malignant lesion but if it's negative we are not 100% sure that this is that we are actually excluding malignancy it might be malignant then we have bronchoscopy or transthoracic needle biopsy these are the most appropriate next step in the most patient with intermediate probability of malignancy so most of the time those patients who are having this intermediate probability we can go for this bronchoscopy uh, or thra transthoracic needle biopsy that is considered to be the most appropriate next step see they are not asking you the initial thing and they're not asking you the most accurate treatment they're asking you the most appropriate next step so if we are considering the most appropriate next step and we are thinking of this intermediate probability which is the characteristic which is in between the benign and the malignant one then the most appropriate next step will be bronchoscopy and transthoracic always you need to follow the question the way of the question if the question is asking you the next most appropriate so you have to tell the next most appropriate not the initial one and not the most accurate one right but if they're asking you what is the initial management then of course it's sputum cytology right now so see exactly so these are the most appropriate next step in the most patient with intermediate probability of malignancy that is bronchoscopy and transthoracic needle biopsy use bronchoscopy for central lesion so if the lesion is central go ahead for this bronchoscopy transthoracic biopsy is rarely used for peripheral lesion so if it's a peripheral lesion we can go for this transthoracic as well but it's rarely used for peripheral lesions now lung cancer screening indications what are the indications in which you are going to offer lung cancer screening there is screening is screening in those who are having history of 30 pack year tobacco history so if it's a history if history is there with this 30 pack year tobacco then you have to screen your patient for lung cancer if the patient is having age 55 or more than that of course you're going to screen your patient for lung cancer and especially chest CT if there is something in the chest CT if there is some finding in the chest CT then you need to go for the lung cancer screening 
So these are some of the indications. 30 back year to back of three, uh, age 55 years, and those who are having suspicious chest CT, you can always go for lung screening, lung cancer screening. Now tip for us is that relax about the diagnostic test question in intermediate lesion. A clear answer must be present. For instance, the choice of test may not be clear, but the adverse effects are always clear. And the thing which is, which is clear, they will always ask you that thing. The thing which are uh, controversial, they will never ask you a question on that. So the most common adverse effect of a transthoracic biopsy is pneumothorax see the most common adverse effect of transthoracic biopsy this is considered to be the most adverse common adverse effect so by doing transthoracic biopsy actually we can introduce pneumothorax so pneumothorax is considered to be one of the common adverse effect of transthoracic biopsy this is most common one now positron emission tomography that is PET scanning this is a way of telling whether the content of the intermediate risk lesion is malignant without a biopsy if you don't want to do biopsy and you want to check then you can go for this PET scanning so if you don't want to do biopsy then without biopsy the way of telling whether the content of intermediate risk lesion is malignant or not when the lesion is malignant and or not you can go for this PET scanning so malignancy has increased uptake of that glucose if it's really a case of malignancy if there's malignant nodule then definitely it's going to uptake of that glucose there will be increased uptake of that glucose when you're doing PET scanning and the sensitivity of PET scan is 85 to 95 percent so if it's positive really it's a cancer a negative scan points away from malignancy see this is important to differentiate if you're doing PET scanning and if PET scan comes negative it means that you are actually excluding malignancy because the specificity of and sensitivity of PET scanning is 85 to 95 percent but if the patient was having this bronchoscopy and transthoracic so uh, we can't say that like if if the findings like negative cytology or negative a negative bronchoscopy then you can't say exclusively or absolutely that this patient is having benign lesion no we can't say that right because you know a negative cytology does not exclude malignancy similarly but here pat scanning is very sensitive pat scanning is highly sensitive 85 to 95 percent sensitivity is there so if it's negative then definitely negative scan points away from malignancy so PET is most accurate with larger lesions. So of course there are some indicate there are some parameters by which we are go actually going for this PET scanning when we are not opting for biopsy. When you are not opting for biopsy, then only you can go for PET scanning. And always remember when there is a larger lesion, when there is a larger lesion that is more than one centimeter, then only you can go for this PET scanning. Now we have video assisted thoracic surgery that's VATS. VATS in both more is both more sensitive and more specific than all the other forms of testing so it is more superior. Frozen section in the operating room allows for intermediate conversion to an open thoracoscopy and lobectomy if malignancy is on. So frozen, frozen section is, is a blessing right. In the meanwhile you just you know send your specimen for frozen section. And at that particular time, they will tell you after histopathology, after seeing in microscope, they will tell you if it's a benign, if it's a malignant. You just keep your patient under anesthesia. And if they say like it's a benign lesion, you just close it. And if they say no, it's a malignant lesion, at that particular time, because your patient is under anesthesia, you can always go for resection. So that's very nice that by doing this frozen section, then and there we can decide whether we are going to close our patient without doing anything because it's a benign lesion or we are going to remove because it's a cancer it's a malignant lesion now we're coming towards interstitial lung disease interstitial lung disease pulmonary fibrosis is thickening of the interstitial septum of the lung between the arteriolar space and the alveolus this is important fibrosis is actually thickening of what thickening of interstitial septum of the lung so this is interstitial septal thickening of the lung and where it is this inter interstitial septum it's in between the arteriolar space and the alveolus so the space which is in between arteriolar arteriole and the alveolus actually there is interstitial septal thickening of the lung that is uh, that is you know you're going to see this is pulmonary fibrosis so fibrosis interferes with gas exchange in both direction in and out and out and in both direction direction will be interfered with the with this with the with the you know as a consequence of fibrosis so fibrosis can be idiopathic 
or secondary to a large number of inflammatory conditions, radiations, drug or from inhalation of toxin, all of them thicken the septum. So this is important. This is the main etiology because we don't, first of all, we don't know the etiology. It's idiopathic. Idiopathic or sometimes maybe secondary. Secondary means this is not a primary thing It because of anything, right? So secondary to a large number of inflammatory conditions. There are some inflammatory conditions which is responsible or which are responsible for producing this fibrosis say for example any inflammatory condition of the lung or maybe radiation or maybe drugs or from inhalation of toxins these are the multiple things which are actually primary and as a result of them you are going to see fibrosis so that will be secondary to large number of these conditions all of them thicken the septa and only some have white blood cell infiltrates with lymphocytes or neutrophils chronic conditions lead to fibrosis and thickening so it will take time it's not a matter of one or two days so it's a chronic condition that leads to fibrosis and thickening it is also known as idiopathic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia you can say that that's an another word for for this fibrosis right whether you're going to say interstitial lung disease or you can say idiopathic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia because it's it's secondary to inflammatory conditions now what are the specific causes of pulmonary fibrosis if you are considering the causes it can be idiopathic means you don't know the etiology you don't know the reason you don't know the cause or it may be interstitial pulmonary fibrosis like the same we did in it may be because of any radiation history it may be because of drug like bleomycin busulfan amiodarone and this methysergide this nitrofurin twin cyclophosphamide methotrexate so these are all the drugs which can cause pulmonary fibrosis so drug history can be there radiation history can be there it may be idiopathic we don't know the cause it may be interstitial pulmonary fibrosis they are all included in specific causes of pulmonary fibrosis so inflammatory infiltration with white blood cells if you're seeing there is inflammatory infiltration right inflammation is there definitely wbc's will be raised so with white blood cells irreversible is reversible like means reversible means it's treatable so whenever there is inflammatory infiltration whenever whenever there is inflammatory inflammation with the rise of wbc count it means that this is a reversible disease this is a treatable disease but once it is converted into fibrosis it cannot be reversed so that is considered to be irreversible so if it's inflammatory infiltration that is the reversible thing that is the treatable thing with wbc raised count right but if once it goes into fibrosis then it will become irreversible now we're coming towards type of pneumoconiosis we have pneumoconiosis so first of all we are going to see what is the exposure what actually uh, to whom the patient is exposed and what is the disease the patient is going to opt say for example the patient exposed to cold right so if the patient is exposed to cold so which disease you are going to see in that patient it will be a cold workers pneumoconiosis right because of the cold you are going to see cold workers pneumoconiosis in that patient if it's sand blasting rock mining and tunneling exposure if the patient is exposed to sand blasting or rock mining or tunneling the patient might get the silicosis if the patient is a shipyard worker he's doing pipe fitting and all that insulator material handling then he might be suffer from this asbestosis if the patient is working in cotton wool industry then bisinosis can be there disease bisinosis can be there because of the exposure to cotton if the patient is working in electronic manufacturing company then he might get this beryllosis right beryllium is the metal which is going to found especially in electronic companies so beryllosis can be there can be a manifestation of this electronic manufacturer company worker then we have moldy sugar cane so if it's a history if it's exposure history of moldy sugar cane the patient might get this bagasosis right so bagasosis especially in moldy sugar cane brillosis in electronic manufacturer workers bisinosis those who are working in cotton wool industry asbestosis those who are working in shipyard or pipe fitting or insulator material handling those who are who are actually working in rock mining or sand blasting or tunneling setup they might get the silicosis and if it's just a coal exposure then you are going to see coal workers pneumoconiosis in that patient so what actually the presentation of this pneumoconiosis all forms of pulmonary fibrosis regardless of etiology present with your patient presents with 
difficulty in breathing dyspnea worsening on exertion you are going to hurt fine rails or crackles on examination there will be loud pulmonic p2 heart sound there will be clubbing of the fingers so these are the specific presentation if your patient is having pulmonary fibrosis he might be having any one of these feature or all features he will be presenting with difficulty in breathing that is worsening on exertion he will be having crackles on examination he will be having loud p2 heart sound and you are going to see clubbing of the fingers in that patient as well now methotrexate this box is just point to ponder right methotrexate causes fibrosis of both liver and lung this is drug induced and this is the one which can cause fibrosis including lung and liver both so these boxes are always point to ponder it has nothing to do with the topic or maybe it is related but you just need to remember them these are important points now we are coming towards diagnostic test so how you are going to diagnose your patient if it's a case of pneumoconiosis the best initial test is always a chest x-ray see best initial so best initial is chest x-ray and high resolution ct scan is more accurate than a chest x-ray see the wordings it's more accurate they are not saying that this is most accurate most of the time in exam they are asking you only like the best initial one and the most accurate one they rarely or hardly ask this more accurate so we cannot go to going to answer this high resolution ct scan in any of the case of pneumoconiosis because we know very well it is just more accurate as compared to chest x-ray but when it comes to best initial it is always chest x-ray so you should remember that chest x-ray is the best initial one then we can go for this high resolution ct scan which is more accurate as compared to the chest x-ray but it is not the most accurate one the most accurate test is that it's a lung biopsy so here you need to remember the best initial test is chest x-ray and the most accurate test is the lung biopsy echocardiography will often show pulmonary hypertension and possibly right ventricular hypertrophy when you do echocardiography you are going to get pulmonary hypertension in that patient and possibly there may be right ventricular hypertrophy so right ventricular hypertrophy and this pulmonary hypertension these two are the features which you are going to get on electro uh, sorry on echocardiography then again point to ponder n acetylcysteine does not help lung disease if you're considering n acetyl as an acetyl cysteine as an antidote so just remember it's not going to help you for the lung disease any lung disease is not going to help you out just point to ponder now this is a ct which is showing severe long-standing interstitial fibrosis produces thick wall between the alveoli that give the appearance of honeycombing right so here you are going to see this all see especially here in this area this is severe long-standing interstitial fibrosis right and this actually produces thick wall between alveoli that give the appearance of honeycombing all right then we are having this PFTs, pulmonary function test. So in pulmonary function test, first of all, restrictive lung disease with decrease of everything proportionality. So in proportionality, you are going to see restrictive lung disease. And when you do pulmonary function testing, you are going to see restrictive lung disease. The force expiratory volume, the force vital capacity, the total lung capacity, all you are going to see and residual volume will all be decreased. So FEV1, FEVC, TLC, your residual volume, all your going to see that all will be decreased but since everything is decreased so when you're taking the ratio when everything is decreased the ratio will be normal it's common sense right if you even to a vc ratio if you're going to calculate the ratio if everything is decreased the ratio will be normal and this diffuse lung capacity for carbon monoxide that is dlco is decreased in proportion to the severity of the thickening of the alveolar septum so dlco is also decreased FEV1, FEVC ratio is normal, but other than that, all the pulmonary function testing, if you do that, you're finding this restrictive lung disease, FEV1, FEVC, TLC, residual volume, all will be decreased, ratio will be normal, and this diffusion lung capacity for carbon monoxide is also decreased. Biopsy shows granulomas in brillosis. Again, this is point to ponder. It has nothing to do with this topic that's just a you know previous one that, that that's showing the actually the exactly what what you're going to see in virulosis patient so biopsy shows granulomas in especially in those virulosis patient and we know virulosis right virulosis where the the patient is exposed to electronic manufacturing company all right then we have the treatment so how you're going to treat 
your interstitial lung disease say for example pneumoconiosis so most type of interstitial lung disease are untreatable if the biopsy shows white blood cell or inflammatory infiltrate prednisone should be used so it all depends what the finding is say for example if biopsy finding is showing wbc's or inflammatory infiltrate so if wbc's are raised or if you're going to see inflammatory infiltrate you need to treat your patient with steroids like prednisone prednisone should be used of all the causes of pneumoconiosis bariolosis is the most most likely to respond to treatment with steroids so usually they respond well with this steroids this is due to the presence of granulomas which are a sign of inflammation so that's why the point to ponder here it's quite relevant here that biopsy shows granulomas and biopsy if it's showing granulomas then on that granuloma prednisone is going to work well that's why most of the time we are seeing that treatment with steroid is most likely to respond it is most likely responded in the case of this bariolosis right because of the granuloma there and biopsy shows granuloma on bariolosis in bariolosis especially and that is going to be treated well with the use of steroids so this is due to the presence of granulomas which are sign of inflammation in patient who do respond to steroid right who do respond to steroid now your next target will be to wean your patient off from steroids because you can't give steroids for a longer period of time so you have certain medicine in your hand which you can always prescribe whenever you want to wean patient off from steroids say for example in patient who do respond to steroid you can switch to azathioprine for long term treatment to get the patient off steroids if there is no response to steroid or azathioprine then you can try something else like you can try for cyclophosphamide so it is always better Better first start with this azathioprine, and then you can azathioprine, and then you can you know uh, uh, just uh, those who are responding with the steroids, you can uh, you know shift your patient from steroids to azathioprine, and if your patient is not responding either to its steroids or azathioprine, then you need to treat your patient, or you can try for cyclophosphamide. Now, agents to decrease the rate of progression of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. What are the agents that can decrease the rate of progression of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? We have this this one, this um, perfenidone, or we have this nantidineb, right? Right, a nantidineb and this perfenidone slow the rate of fibrosis. These are the new agents, right? They are going to decrease the rate of progression of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis this perfenidone is an anti-fibrotic agent that inhibits collagen synthesis so if it's going to inhibit collagen synthesis that's why you're going to see decrease the rate of progression of this fibrosis this nentinidineb is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that blocks the fibrogenic growth factors and inhibit fibroblasts so it's it's actually blocking the fibrogenic growth factor and thereby inhibiting fibroblasts and therefore decreasing the rate of progression of fibrosis so you need to remember these two two this one is perfinin uh, this perfinidone and second one is nentendineb and these two are actually responsible to slow the rate of fibrosis now we are coming towards hypersensitivity pneumonitis hypersensitivity pneumonitis is an exaggerated immunological response to repeated administration of antigens such as actinomyces you are going to repeat the administration of antigens and because of this repeated administration of antigen your patient immunological response is exaggerated and when the patient's immunological response is exaggerated that is termed as hypersensitivity pneumonitis right so what are those uh, you know repeated administration what are those antigens at that that antigen must be actinomyces or it may be fungi or it may be moles and birds droppings anything these are all the antigens right these are all the antigens by which our patient's immunological response is saturated because of the repeated administration of these antigens like fungi mold bird droppings and actinomyces exposure and because of that a patient develops this hypersensitivity pneumonitis so in addition to cough and dyspnea there are symptoms of acute inflammatory response it's not like that always your patient is going to present with cough and difficulty in breathing no in case of hypersensitivity reaction your patient may present with acute inflammatory response as well and what do we mean by acute inflammatory responses like chills malaise myalgias rashes these are all the inflammatory responses 
So these are associated with this hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Symptoms markedly decreased decrease a few days after the end of the exposure, unlike interstitial fibrosis. So symptoms markedly decrease a few days after the end of the exposure. So once the patient is start exposing, the patient must be experiencing all these signs and symptoms. But as soon as you know symptoms markedly decrease after the end of the exposure as soon as the patient is going to be you know eliminated or the exposure point is eliminated exposure thing is eliminated from the patient's life then you are going to see the symptoms markedly decrease unlike interstitial fibrosis interstitial fibrosis is irreversible right once it's there it's there you can't reverse it but these symptoms especially of hypersensitivity pneumonitis if exposure is there if antigen is there of course it, the, the disease is there but as soon as the antigen exposure exposure is diminished or eliminated or ejected definitely the patient's symptoms markedly decrease and improve chest x-ray and ct show bilateral hazy opacity what you're going to see on chest x-ray and on ct you're going to see bilateral hazy opacities patients with persistent severe post exposure symptoms are given glucocorticoids so patient with persistent those who are having persistent and severe post exposure symptom post exposure symptoms towards antigens right whatever the antigen is maybe it's actinomyces maybe it's fungi maybe moles maybe birds dropping anything so you can use glucocorticoid in that patient so what are the symptoms and how you're going to treat if your patient is having interstitial lung disease or if your patient is having hypersensitivity pneumonitis so now we are going to differentiate between interstitial lung disease on the basis of symptoms and on the basis of treatment these two you need to differentiate interstitial lung disease and hypersensitivity pneumonitis so on the basis of symptoms if you're talking about interstitial lung disease then lung only if there is no fever and only lung lungs are involved right and it's a chronic thing and it's a progressive thing always think of this interstitial lung disease but if the patient is complaining of fever chills myalgia and symptoms that i one to two days after exposure ends after after exposure and the patient was exposed to particular antigen and after the end of the exposure symptoms if arises after one to two days then you can say symptoms arise after one to two days then you can say this is a case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis now how you're going to treat your patient if he is having interstitial lung disease if idiopathic you don't know the etiology then you can go for these two two medications this pyrfinidone and nintendinib right but treatment of hypersensitivity hypersensitivity pneumonitis they are best treated with glucocorticoids azathioprine or mycophenolate if chronic steroids needed if chronic steroids needed then or only if chronic steroids needed then only you can go for this azathioprine because steroids you can't give for a much longer period of time you need to have something in uh, to wean off patient from steroids so that's why we are having this azathioprine to pay to wean off patient from steroids or mycophenolate now we are coming towards cryptogenic organizing pneumonia this cryptogenic organizing pneumonia previously called bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia that is known as bo right bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia or you can say cryptogenic organizing pneumonia this cryptogenic organizing pneumonia presents as a patchy process with proliferation of granulation tissue in small airways and ducts so you are going to see granulation tissue in small airways and small ducts and there is proliferation of granulation tissue especially in these small areas so that is actually cryptogenic organizing pneumonia this is the presentation of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia which is actually presenting as there are patchy process and proliferation of granulation tissue in small airways and ducts so the infection presents like community acquired pneumonia you are very much confused with this whether it's a case of community acquired pneumonia whether it's a case of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia because representation is quite similar here also the patient is going to present with cough or is going to present with difficulty in breathing dyspnea fever malaise weight loss and it does not respond to antibiotics see it's very important if it's a case of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia your patient is not going to respond with antibiotics it is caused by infections and autoimmune disorder there is no specific imaging on x-ray or ct the most accurate test is lung biopsy you're not going to get anything on x-ray you're not going to get anything on the ct scan definitely you have to go for lung biopsy 
and glucocorticoids resolve symptoms but you need to wean patient off from this glucocorticoid and in order to do that you can use any medication especially these two medications right where are these two medications this one mm, yeah where are those this uh, i think this one preferred don't or nintedinib or no sorry this one in order to wean patient off from steroids glucocorticoid you can use this azathioprine or mycophenolate so either you are going to use azathioprine or mycophenolate to patient wean off from steroids all right then we have there is no specific imaging on x-ray or ct the most accurate test is lung biopsy now now this is finished we are coming towards eosinophilic pneumonia eosinophilic pneumonia as the name indicate this form of pneumonia presents as one to two weeks of fever cough and shortness of breath that progresses to respiratory failure the patient is having you know this pneumonia and it actually present as one to two weeks of fever continuously the patient is having fever for two weeks and he's having cough and he's having shortness of breath that actually going to progress to respiratory failure so look for these in the patient history you need to see something in the patient history first of all cancer you need to evaluate whether the patient is having cancer some of some of some form of cancer in the body or medication what medication he is using are he is using amiodarone or ansets or nitrofurantoin or phenytoin or daptomycin because these are important to exclude whenever you are taking history and your patient is having eosinophilic pneumonia you need to rule out all these things from your patient there may be any history of parasitic infection like a strongyloid a strongyo strongyloidiasis right strongyloidiasis ascariasis trichinellosis and schistosomiasis so these are all the parasitic infections and you need to evaluate these parasitic infections of course in those patients who are having this eosinophilic pneumonia presentation will be quite similar the most accurate test is presence of eosinophils on bronchoalveolar lavage like when you do bronchoalveolar lavage when you do lung biopsy you will see that there is multiple number or multi, uh, there, you, there you can see eosinophilia right so most accurate test you can directly go for the most accurate test and this is considered to be a, a count of eosinophilic count and if it's eosinophilia then definitely either eosinophilia on this bronchoalveolar lavage or eosinophilia you are going to see on lung biopsy in both of the cases this is confirmed and you need to treat your patient with steroids so you need to remember that eosinophilic pneumonia should be treated with steroids now we are coming towards sarcoidosis infiltrative diseases of lungs right interstitial lung diseases sarcoidosis is more common in african american women it is an idiopathic inflammatory disorder predominantly of the lungs but can affect most of the body it's not like that it's definitely going to affect you know lungs no it can predominantly affect lung but can affect most of the body part and especially in african american women and idiopathic you don't know the etiology but most likely present as inflammatory disorders so what is the actual presentation what is the most likely diagnosis you need to look for a young african american woman with shortness of breath she is presenting with shortness of breath or exertion and occasional fine rails on lung examination you are going to hurt fine and occasional rails but without the wheezing of asthma you are not going to hurt any wheeze in these patients this case of sarcoidosis in case of sarcoidosis you are not going to hurt any wheeze right but without the wheezing of asthma erythema nodosum and lymph adenopathy either on examination or especially on chest x-ray will hand you the diagnosis question so this is very important here in these patient the patient who is having sarcoidosis you will find erythema nodosum in this patient you will find lymphadenopathy in this patient you are going to see you know especially uh, on chest x-ray these erythema nodosum especially on the basis of chest x-ray you are going to diagnose your patient associated with erythema nodosum associated with lymphadenopathy but you are not going to hurt wheeze in this patient you are going to hurt occasional fine rails on lung examination you need to check this is a particularly a case of african american women look for a young african american woman having no wheeze having fine rails on lung examination she is associated with erythema nodosum and lymphadenopathy especially on the chest x-ray you are going to rule out so definitely you are going to make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis 
Although liver and kidney granulomas are very common on autopsy, they are really symptomatic. Most of the time, these granulomas only you can find on the on autopsy. But then, in during life, the patients mostly asymptomatic. They are not going to present any symptoms. Sarcoidosis also present well. It's not alone that most of the time sarcoidosis is associated with parotid gland enlargement. Whenever there is sarcoidosis, there should be associated parotid gland enlargement in that patient, or there may be facial pulse in that patient, or there may be heart block and restrictive cardiomyopathy patient is that, or there may be CNS involvement, there may be iritis and uveitis. These are all the associated features. In case of sarcoidosis, because sarcoidosis tend to be present with all these features associated with these features. The case of sarcoidosis can have a parotid gland enlargement, can have a facial palsy, can have heart block or restrictive cardiomyopathy. CNS may be involved in that patient, or the patient might be presenting with iritis and uveitis. All answer sarcoidosis when a chest X-ray or CT shows hyalur adenopathy. See here, you are going to see especially in the hyalur areas. This hyalur adenopathy is in generally healthy African American woman. So if there is hyalur adenopathy, that will make you help in diagnosis of sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis with bilateral hyalur adenopathy. Now, what is the diagnostic test? Chest X-ray is the best initial test, and hyalur adenopathy is present in more than ninety-five percent of patients with sarcoidosis. Parenchymal involvement is also present in combination with lymph adenopathy. It's not like that only always all the time. Only hyalur adenopathy is present. No, there may be parenchymal involvement as well. So hyalur adenopathy in most of the time, more than ninety-five percent of cases you are going to see. But parenchymal involvement is also present in combination with lymph. Lymphadenopathy. So there must be lymphadenopathy, and in combination with that, you are going to see parenchymal involvement. Lung, no, sorry, lymph node biopsy is the most accurate test. So you need to remember the best initial and the most accurate. The best initial is chest X-ray, and the most accurate is lymph node biopsy. The granulomas are non-caseating granulomas. In the case of, especially in the case of sarcoidosis. Right, especially in the case of sarcoidosis, you are going to see non-caseating granuloma. But if it's a case of TB, there is caseous necrosis. Yeah. So first of all, you are going to see chest X-ray. That's the best initial one. And hyalur adenopathy is present in more than ninety-five percent of patients with sarcoidosis. Parenchyma involvement is also present in combination with lymph adenopathy, lymph node biopsy, which is the most accurate one. And granulomas are mostly the non-caseating type. When you do the ACE levels, you are going to see that is elevated. Elevated ACE levels in about sixty percent of patients, they will be elevated. Hypercalciuria, hypercalciuria, more amount of calcium in urine. If it's more amount of calcium in urine, it's occurring only in about twenty twenty percent of cases in this in this patient. Hypercalcemia, more amount of calcium in the blood. In about five percent of cases, granulomas and sarcoidosis. Make vitamin D, and vitamin D is responsible for the absorption of calcium. So thereby, you can see hypercalcemia because of vitamin D absorbed vitamin D formation because of this granulomas because granuloma and sarcoidosis they make vitamin D. Pulmonary function testing, testing restrictive lung disease. You are going to see again there will be decrease FEV one and VCL T C with the normal because when two things are decreased when you take a ratio the ratio will be normal. Bronchial vein lavage shows an elevated level of helper cells. This is important to remember. Helper T cells. Bronchial vein lavage shows an elevated level of helper T cells, especially in the case of sarcoidosis. Treatment again, it's an inflammatory reaction. Prednisone is the clear drug of choice. Few patients fail to respond. So first of all, we are going to treat our patient with prednisone, but most of the time, the patient is not responding. Asymptomatic hyalur adenopathy does not need to be treated. If it's an asymptomatic, oh, no doubt, it's an hyalur lymphadenopathy, but it's asymptomatic. If it's asymptomatic, you don't need to treat it. Leave it like that. Now we are coming towards thromboembolic disease. Thromboembolic disease, like pulmonary embolism, pulmonary embolism, and deep vein thrombosis (DVT) are essentially treated at a spectrum of the same disease. It's a PE or it's a DVT. The spectrum, it's the same spectrum for both both the thing. Pulmonary emboli derive from DVT of the large vessel of the legs in seventy percent cases and pelvic vein in thirty percent of cases. But since the risk and treatment are the same, they can be discussed at the same time. 
same time because why because they are since the risk and treatment are the same so if the risk is same if the treatment is same then we can discuss both of them together this pe and dvt most of the time dvt in legs is present in about 70 percent of cases but same pelvic veins in pelvic veins you are going to see only 30 percent so DVTs arise because of stasis from immobility. There must be a case of immobility because of any surgery, any major surgery or trauma history or joint replacement if it's already there or if it's a case of thrombophilia such as factor 5 latent mutation is there and antiphospholipid syndrome case is there. So especially you need to treat your patient. Malignancy of any kind leads to deep venous thrombosis. This is again very important. Any kind of malignancy, malignancy of any kind leads to DVT. And DVT arises because of what? Because of a stasis. The patient is immobile. He has already undergone some major surgery and he can't move. In that patient, you can suspect this DVTs. Right? Now, what is the presentation? What is the most likely diagnosis? You have to look for the sudden onset of shortness of breath with clear lungs on examination and normal chest x-ray. The patient is having normal chest, clear lung and the patient is having normal chest x-ray. Then other findings in pulmonary embolism are there must be increased respiratory rate, tachypnea, there must be heart rate increased, tachycardia, cough is there, hemoptysis is there, unilateral leg pain. Why the patient is having unilateral leg pain? Because of DVT. From DVT, the patient is having unilateral leg pain. Pleuritic chest pain from lung infarction. If there is lung infarction associated, you are going to see pleuritic chest pain. Fever can arise from any cause of clot or hematoma. Whenever there is clot, whenever there is hematoma, the fever can arise. Extremely severe emboli will produce hypotension. If there is severe emboli, extremely severe emboli, that is definitely going to produce hypotension. Hypotension in extremely severe emboli. So these are actually the other findings. Most of the time, you are only going to get shortness of breath. Lungs are clear, the patient is having short of breath. The patient is short of breath, lungs are clear. Think of this, especially pulmonary embolism and DVT. But you can also find your patient is having increased heart rate, difficult increased respiratory rate, there is cough, there is hemoptysis, there is unilateral lack pain, there is pleuritic chest pain from the lung infarction, there is fever can arise from any cause of the clot hematoma. An extremely severe emboli can produce what? It can produce hypertension because it can, you know, especially emboli, these are the floating one. They can dislodge anywhere and they can cause hypertension. They can cause narrowing of the vessel and cause any, any time extremely severe emboli can produce hypertension. Most question about pulmonary embolism concern diagnostic testing and treatment. For example, what diagnostic test we are going to offer? There is no... There is no single uncomplicated diagnostic test for a pulmonary embolism. There is no single uncomplicated diagnostic test. There is not, a, not even a single test for PE. You can go for chest x-ray, you can go for ECG, you can go for ABGs. These are all considered to be the best initial test. So these are best initial tests. What are the best initial tests for pulmonary embolism and uh, these deep venous thrombosis? Chest x-ray. ECG, ABGs. Angiography is the most accurate one but can be fatal in 0.5% of cases. So it's fatal, no doubt it's the most accurate one. After doing an ABG, chest x-ray and ECG, the best next step is most often a CT angiogram. So after doing an ABG, after this ABG, after chest x-ray, after ECG, AKG, then only the best next step remember the words words are very important the best next step they are not saying you the most accurate they are not saying you the best initial one best initial is always chest x-ray ecg and abgs most accurate is always angiography but best next step is most often a ct angiogram so definitely they are not going to ask you the best next step but they may ask so you should know that the best initial is the chest x-ray ecg and abgs most accurate is angiography and more accurate or don't say more accurate best next step best next step after abgs after initial one you can have the ct angiogram 
Now, in pulmonary embolism, the main issue is to know what is the most common finding and what is the most common abnormality when there is an abnormality. The most common wrong answer is here to choose S1, Q3, T3 as the most common abnormality that will be found on EKG. So, EKG abnormality you are not going to say on the basis of that that this is a normal one. Chest X-ray, usually normal in pulmonary embolism, the most common abnormality is atelectasis. So chest X-ray, usually chest X-ray is, is normal, but the most common abnormality in chest X-ray, what you're going to see, atelectasis. Wedge-shaped infarction, there may be pleural-based lesion like Hampton hum and oligemia of one lobe that is known as Westermark sign, oligemia, oligemia one lobe that is Westermark sign are much less common than simple atelectasis. Much less common than simple atelectasis. It means the simple atelectasis tend to be more present in case of pulmonary embolism. But it may be wet shape infarction. It may be plural based lesion. If it's a plural based lesion like lung lesion, you can say this Hampton hum. And you're going to see oligemia of the lobe that is Westermark sign. They are there, but they are much less common as compared to simple atelectasis. Now, what you're going to see on ECG, EKG, usually shows sinus tachycardia, but the most common abnormality is non-specific ST to T wave changes. Only 5% will show right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy or right, ax, right bundle branch block. So these are all the things which you can find on ECG. But the most important thing is that that usually sinus tachycardia you are going to see in your patient. And the most common abnormality, of course, will be non-specific ST to T wave changes. There may be only 5% will show right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy and right bundle branch block. Everything right, right, right. Right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, right bundle branch block. So now we are coming towards ABGs. ABGs will going to give you what result? Hypoxia, respiratory alkalosis, high pH and low partial pressure of carbon dioxide. With the normal chest x-ray are extremely suggestive of pulmonary embolism and you're not going to see anything on the chest x-ray but still the patient is having high pH and low partial pressure of carbon dioxide. It is always going to give you, tell you a clue that the patient is hypoxic and he is in respiratory alkalosis. The baby is hypoxic and the baby is in respiratory alkalosis. If you're going to see high pH and low partial pressure of carbon dioxide with the normal chest x-ray, extremely suggestive of pulmonary embolism so a 65 year old woman who recently underwent hip replacement comes to the emergency department with the acute onset of shortness of breath and tachycardia the chest x-ray is normal with hypoxia on abgs and increased aa gradient and in an akg with sinus tachycardia so this 65 year old woman she already underwent hip replacement hip, hip re replacement already done right because she went in she comes uh, uh, actually uh, underwent hip replacement comes to the emergency department with acute onset of shortness of breath and tachycardia Cardia. She was there in emergency with shortness of breath and with tachycardia and that's why the hip replacement you know was done in emergency. Now the chest x-ray is normal with hypoxia on ABGs and increase A gradient and EKG with sinus tachycardia. So what is the most appropriate next step in the management? What you're going to do next if your patient's chest x-ray is normal but she is hypoxic on ABGs and she is having increased AA gradient or especially of this ABGs and an EKG and EKG is showing sinus tachycardia. Now what you are going to do next? What is the most appropriate next step in management? So in next step in management will be you are going to give low molecular weight heparin that is inoxaparin. This is considered to be the most appropriate next step. When the history and initial labs are suggestive of PE, it is far more important to start therapy. Better not to go with LM, uh, low molecular, but, but it's better to go with this directly with this low molecular weight heparin or inoxaparin or with this uh, non oral vitamin A, A dependent anticoagulant, right? So you, ca you can have this NOAC medication with you. You can use this medication. These are newly prescribed medication. You can use this low molecular weight heparin or inoxaparin then to wait for the result of hap confirmatory testing such as the spiral CT or ventilation perfusion scan of course we will see the spiral CT in ventilation perfusion scan but right now don't waste your time you can go for the treatment option first and the treatment option is for all this low molecular for all this condition you have this low molecular weight happen or non or 
with this NOAC medication. Alright, so D dimer, why D dimer H choice? We haven't choose that. Why? Because D dimer is a poor choice when the presentation is clear because its specificity is, specificity is poor. Its specificity is poor. So why we are going to do D dimer? D dimer is a poor choice here because when presentation is clear, the presentation is quite clear. There is no point because its specific specificity is poor. So you are not going to do this, especially for the diagnostic purpose. Embolectomy is rarely done and is performed only if heparin is ineffective. So embolectomy, this uh, number of D option that you are also not going to do because embolectomy is rarely done and is performed only when this heparin is ineffective. And there is persistent hypertension, there is persistent hypoxia or tachycardia and there is no benefit of IV unfractionated heparin except a short half-life. This unfractionated heparin, they are having very short half-life, right? This is the only thing. Other than that, there is no benefit of this IV and fractionated heparin. Always use this low molecular weight heparin. Now, CT angiogram. What the CT angiogram tells you? Also called a spiral CT. Whether you can say spiral CT, you can say CT angiogram is the standard of care in terms of diagnostic testing to confirm the presence of a PE after the X-ray EKG and ABGs are done. So it's it's very important. Like also you can go for it so it's the same thing it's synonyms right you can say ct angiogram or you can say spiral ct means the same thing right it's the standard of care in terms of diagnostic testing to confirm the presence of pulmonary embolism after the x-ray so when you want to confirm the pulmonary embolism after the x-ray then definitely you're going to go with this ct angiogram ekg and abgs are done the specificity is excellent over 95 percent and sensitivity of clinically significant clots varies from 95 to 98 percent so this is important because the specificity is excellent now ventilation perfusion scan this high probability scan have no clot this is false positive in 15% of cases. So this is important. Ventilation perfusion scan sometime in about 15% of cases, they uh, actually they, they, they are coming under this high probability scanning and they have no clots. Low probability scans have a clot that is a false negative result in about 50% of cases and a completely normal scan essentially crackles, ex ex sorry, essentially exclude a clot a completely normal scan essentially excludes a clot. If it's a completely normal, definitely your clot is excluded. Ventilation perfusion scan is a choice for patients with borderline renal function and in whom the renal toxicity of the contrast with CT angiogram should be avoided. So if you want to avoid this contrast media because your patient is uh, having this renal toxicity towards this contrast material or so in that case, ventilation provision scan is a choice for patient with borderline renal function. So if someone is having borderline function, you can offer him this ventilation perfusion scan. And of course, you are going to avoid the CT angiogram. It should be avoided in the case of renal toxicity. So this is ventilation. This is normal ventilation. But if it's abnormal areas of decreased perfusion, you're going to see this is perfusion. This is perfusion and here you're going to see abnormal areas of decreased perfusion. But this is the one normal ventilation. Now D-dimer. D-dimer, this test is very sensitive, better than 97% negative predictive value. So this is very sensitive D-dimer. But the specificity is poor. Since any cause of clot or increased bleeding can elevate the D-dimer level. It's not like that only in all, uh, uh, most of the time in, in these patients you're going to see. No, it's not like that. Maybe, you know, maybe this test is very sensitive, better than 97% negative predictive value, but the specificity is poor since any cause of clot or increased bleeding can elevate the D-dimer level. If it's any, so if there is any clot, if there is any increased bleeding, that can elevate the D-dimer level. A negative test, however, exclude a clot, but a positive doesn't mean anything. If D-dimer is negative, definitely you're going to say there is no clot in that patient, but if it's positive, that doesn't mean anything but a positive test doesn't mean anything you need to go for for best best diagnostic and the most accurate diagnostic not the d dimer the chest x-ray must be normal for the ventilation perfusion scan to have any degree of accuracy in order to do anything related to you know chest x-ray but, but that must be normal 
so you need to go for this ventilation perfusion scanning to have any degree of accuracy the chest x-ray must be normal for the ventilation perfusion scan this scan should be normal in the chest x-ray only then you you know you are going to say yeah the, the, this is this is safe so d dimer is the answer when the presence pre-test probability of permanent embolism is low and you need a simple non-invasive test to exclude thromboembolic disease so tip for us is here is that d dimer is the answer when the pre-test probability of pulmonary embolism is low if the probability is low then you only go for this d dimer and you need a simple non-invasive test to exclude thromboembolic disease so if you want to exclude thromboembolic disease you just have a simple non-invasive test that's simple now low extremity doppler study when do we perform this low extremity doppler study if the low extremity doppler is positive no further testing is needed only 80 percent of this pulmonary embolism this originate in the lungs so it will miss 30 percent of cases and you do not need a spiral c2 ventilation provision scan to confirm a pe if there is clot in the legs because they will not change therapy so there is no point of giving this especially this uh, especially the patient will still need heparin in six months of warfarin so these are the case of low extremity doppler study in the case of low extremity doppler study if doppler is positive it means that you are not going to do anything else and only 80 percent of this pulmonary embolism only 80 percent originate in the legs so it will miss 30 percent of cases 80 percent is originating in the legs right and they are missing 30 percent of cases and you do not need a spiral c2 ventilation provision scan to confirm a pe this uh, spiral ct and ventilation provision scan is not for the confirmation of pe if there is a clot in the leg because they will not change therapy the patient will still need heparin in six months of warfarin especially he is having this this problem but again you need to give heparin and six months of warfarin to your patient so this is important you do not need a spiral ct or ventilation provision scan to confirm b this line is very very important you just make a note of it now lower extremity dopplers are a good test if the ventilation provision and spiral ct do not give a clear diagnosis if you're not getting clear diagnosis with the help of this ventilation perfusion scan and with the help of this spiral CT, you're not going to get a clear diagnosis. Then only go for lower extremity dopplers. So spiral CT negative, it means that you're going to go for this ventilation perfusion scan or lower extremity doppler if it's come negative then withhold therapy with heparin you need to withhold therapy by using heparin so the sequence must to be monitored you first go for spiral ct if it's come negative you go for ventilation perfusion scan or lower extremity doppler if it's again come negative then only you're going to withhold therapy with heparin now we're coming towards angiography the most accurate test with nearly 100 percent specificity and a false negative rate under one percent unfortunately there is 0.5 percent mortality which is high if you consider the tens of thousands of tests in a year that would need to be done to exclude pe in all cases so angiography no doubt this is the most accurate test with nearly 100 percent specificity and a false negative rate under one percent so this is very good this is considered to be the most accurate test when testing for pulmonary embolism angiography with the catheter is really done so whenever you are doing you are testing a patient for pulmonary embolism definitely angiography with the catheter is really done you're not going to do angiography with the help of catheter now what to do is not always clear however the adverse effect of angiography that is allergy renal toxicity that is very clear to the question so on the basis of adverse effect you are going to choose your answer so the USMLE step 2 seek exam will ask clear question about management of this APL syndrome and will not ask you to choose between two acceptable forms of therapy they are not going to ask you two acceptable forms of therapy only one therapy one time this NOAC medication and low molecular weight heparin that is enoxaparin followed by warfarin is an acceptable therapy first of all you are going to start with this NOAC and low molecular weight heparin and then only you're going to follow this by warfarin hemodynamically stable patient can be treated with NOAC without using enoxaparin first there is no need for enoxaparin with NOAC if the patient is hemodynamically stable right 
North causes less intracranial bleeding than warfarin. So these are new oral anticoagulants, right? So they actually they are having less intracranial bleeding chances. They are having do not need INR monitoring and do not need an oxaparin first. These uh, NOAC treat DVT and permanent embolism with efficacy at least as well as an oxaparin and warfarin. So by efficacy point of view, they're all same. Debigatron, which is one of the NOAC, can be reversed with either rosuzumab. Right, this is the reverse reversibility can be changed. This Fonda Perinox is safe to use in heparin induced thrombocytopenia. If there is heparin induced thrombocytopenia, you need to use this Fonda Perinox. Fonda Perinox is easier to monitor than a, a this uh, Argetrobon. So, Argetrobon, this is again one of the NOAC. It's, it's if you're considering this Fonda Perinox and this Argetrobon, uh, then of course, in comparison to Argetrobon, Fonda Perinox is much easier to monitor. So, we have this NOAC medication, we have this Regzoban, Epixaban, Edoxaban, Debigatron. These are all oral agents that do not require INR monitoring and can be used for the treatment of pulmonary emboli. So, they are actually not required oral agents that do not require INR monitoring and can be used for the treatment of pulmonary emboli. So, these are NOAC medications. And they reach a therapeutic effect in several hours instead of several days like warfarin. It will not going to take too much time. Just a, just a matter of several days. Warfarin requires initial therapy with low molecular weight heparin. So you need to get start treatment with your patient. And start treatment of your patient with warfarin. You just have to go quickly for this this uh, particularly low molecular weight heparin testing right initial therapy with low molecular weight heparin that requires initial therapy with low molecular weight heparin so this uh, andizenet reverses noox you should remember that what are the medications that can reverse noox so the reverse reversibility of noox can be possible with the help of this andizen and the zenet medication this andizenet can reverse noox what agent reverse anticoagulation? First of all, this antizen alpha that is going to reverse rivexaban, epexaban, and edoxaban. We have this hydrosuzumab that reverses debigatron. So, debigatron is reversed by hydrosuzumab. Prothrombin complex concentrate that is known as PCC. PCC can reverse warfarin. Warfarin is somewhat very dangerous, right? And especially it's stratagenic. We can't use in pregnant patients as warfarin. But warfarin here, it can be reversed. Toxicity of warfarin can be reversed with the help of this prothrombin complex concentrate. Now, when is an inferior vena cava that is IVC inferior vena cava filter the right answer? There are contraindications to the use of anticoagulant, for example, melanin and CNS bleeding. There may be recurrent emboli while on NOAC or fully therapeutic warfarin INR of two to three days. There you can see that there the filter, vena cava filter is the right answer. If there is contraindication to the use of anticoagulant, if there is recurrent emboli, if there is right ventricular dysfunction with an enlarged right ventricle on echo. In this case, disease is so severe that an inferior vena cava filter is placed because the next embolus, even if seemingly small, could be potentially fatal. So, if you're using inferior vena cava filter, think of this contraindication to the use of anticoagulant. Think of this recurrent emboli, wherever you are going, right? Recurrent emboli, if it's there, then of course, while a NOAC or fully therapeutic warfarin, the, the chances of recurrent emboli is there. And right ventricular dysfunction with an enlarged RV or an echo, in this case, this is so severe that an RVC filter is placed because the next embolus, even if seemingly small, could be potentially fatal. So, when are thrombolytics the right answer? When you are going to use thrombolytics, hemodynamically unstable patient. Those who are hemodynamically unstable, for example, hypertension is there, systolic BP less than 90 and tachycardic, acute respiratory, uh, you know, RV dysfunction, acute uh, right ventricular dysfunction. In all these cases, you can say in acute RV dysfunction, in hemodynamically unstable patient, we can use thrombolytics, the right answer. That's a, that's, that should be the answer. Thrombolytic should be administered if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and if the patient is having acute RV dysfunction. Now, what are the thrombolytics and pulmonary embolism we are using? Uh, and what are the criteria for using thrombolytics and pulmonary embolism? Especially, there is hypertensive an acute right heart stain if there is acute heart right heart strain 
that is also going to be you know associated with thrombolytics and PPE and hypotensive so these are the two criteria where you need to give thrombolytics in a case of hypertensive patient and the case of acute right heart strain patient so this is chest CT or inferior vena cava filter there is showing inferior vena cava filter when are directing when are direct acting thrombin inhibitors direct acting thrombin inhibitors used where you are going to use this especially direct acting thrombo thrombin inhibitors that is yeah ergotriban ergotriban is one of the direct acting thrombin inhibitor or in heparin induced thrombocytopenia Fundaprinox is an inhibitor that is an alternative to heparin. So, if you're using heparin, fundaprinox is just an alternative to heparin. And in heparin induced thrombocytopenia, especially, you are going to use this fundaprinox. When is aspirin the answer? Never. Here, you're not going to use aspirin. Fundaprinox can be used if there is heparin induced, especially. Yeah, when there is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. If there is heparin uh, induced thrombocytopenia, there you can use this pointer Please remember that this is an inhibitor and this is an alternative to heparin. So, when what is aspirin the answer? Never. Pointer can be used if there is hyper uh, if there is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. All right. So, this one is just a recourse triad and this triad actually showing us the predispositions to venous thromboembolism. So, on one end of this triad, we have the stasis of blood flow that may be because of immobility, that may be because of congestive heart failure, that may be because of recent surgery history. The other end of the triangle, this triad is actually hypercoagulability state, this factor 5 latent mutation and any malignancy can lead to this DVT deep venous thrombosis and one side of the triangle this triad is endothelial injury there may be a trauma there may be history of surgery or maybe history of recent fail fracture in all of these cases you are going to get endothelial injury just make a note of it that whenever there is a triad of stasis of blood flow because of endothelial injury and associated with hypercoagulability then definitely this triangle is actually showing us the predisposition to venous thromboembolism and this triangle is known as Verkos triad. This triad is known as Verkos triad. Alright, I'm just going to stop here. So tomorrow inshallah we are going to start with this pulmonary happiness. In about two sessions, we'll try to cover this pulmonology. Next on the request of one doctor, we are going to start gynecology. Okay, thank you so much.